Okay. So we'll call our special meeting on August 26th, 25th. Order. Roll call shows that all counselors are present except for Councilor Osher, and Councilor Mitchell is joining us remotely as she is out of town. You scheduled this for now, but my goal is to make it much shorter than an hour. Can I tell you, if you guys are in control All right. of this, we'll, we'll go as fast see. as you are desiring. So we have just two items on our agenda under this special meeting. In order 21-150, order increasing FY22 municipal revenue budget, parks and recreation expense budget to add an after-school program to the 21-22 school year. And I'm not sure who's handling this. Um, Motion on that. Why don't we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Move and seconded, and I will have some I'll discussion or presentation. Yeah, no, I will take it. Um, there is a fairly lengthy memo in your background material, um, but to summarize the memo, um, last week staff learned that Old Town um, Recreation was not going to be offering. Um, it's after school program. We know that we have a handful of, of families that use that after school program. Um, it, when we learned that news, we were doing some reaching out and um, we decided it would be a good opportunity to just check in with our partners to see if things had changed. And by things changing, the biggest barrier that the town has faced when trying to provide Parks and Recreation programming in the past has been the um, lack of appropriate space that the town had consistent access to. So if you recall, we shared space with the University of Maine where we would split the week and part of the week was at the rec center and the other part of the week was um, bouncing around um, the community. Sometimes it was at the Birch Street School Sometimes it was in classrooms at the middle school. Um, and what we, we got feedback from the community that that bouncing around was really not desirable. They wanted to be able to pick their kid up at the same place every time. And they wanted to have plenty of space so that kids could run around and, you know, be kids after school. Um, when we got down to an average of approximately six or no kids, because remember at this point, we had tried partnering with BZ to bring participation numbers up. The quality of the program just wasn't there. You can't bring six kids, the same six kids together um, every day and have a quality recreation-based program. So at that point, we came back to town council and council directed staff to work with our regional partners, which were Old Town Parks and Rec, or it's just Rec, Old Town Rec and uh, Old Town Orono YMCA to try to make sure that there was a safety net of coverage, um, ch child care coverage available <coughs> to um, parents um, of Asa Adams kids. We did that. Um, when um, we had, in fact, Councilor Perry um, joined us in a conversation with the school over the summer late spring, early summer, talking about access to um, ASA Adams for programming. Um, so when we learned that Old Town Rec was not gonna be offering after school, I reached back out to Superintendent of Schools, Meredith Higgins, to talk about whether or not there might be some space in ASA Adams. And um, she very quickly committed uh, to supporting the after school program if we were to run one. Um, so what she is committed to is uh, they have a new cafeteria, which is all brand new space, and the gymnasium. Um, there will be times we can only be in one because she needs it for a school function, whichever might be the cafeteria, might be the gym. And then there will be times when we would have access to both spaces. Um, so at a minimum, we would have one of those spaces. Um, we are still working to try to get into um, ASA, have we done that? To just look at it? Megan and I have been. Good. Yeah. Um, I'm on vacation this week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, 
we are going to work with the school, our life safety folks, and um, uh, campus recreation to determine what a reasonable cap would be given the space constraints, because every space is going to have constraints. Mm -hmm. um, but having a space that we're number one, not having to pay for, because the tax bill is already paying for that space. Um, and number two is so convenient to not only the drop off of parents, but also playground, outdoor space, um, indoor space that would be big enough if it was um, not great weather, um, kind of moved us into the next step, which was to reach out to campus recreation. Um, I know people want to call this childcare, and I know it might fill a childcare need for folks. This is not childcare, and I, I hope you think of it as after school camp, parks and recreation. So it's recreation based, enrichment based, leisure based activities. Um, campus recreation uh, was willing to do a lot of prep work for this meeting with us. Um, we would, we are suggesting that we not run this as a revenue sharing program, which is how we run um, other programs that we do. Um, this is a huge commitment for them because it's a nine month commitment. If we say we're going to do this, we really would need to run it for the whole school year. Um, they, I have a, a graduated administrative fee that they would charge and then pass through their labor costs and direct expenses. I think it's a reasonable contract. We kind of, it's a model that we've worked with on other things before. It's what we did with the pool. Um, and uh, we sent a survey out. Um, the superintendent of schools helped us um, access ASA parents. Uh, we sent a survey out saying, would you um, participate? And we received 105 responses. 86 of those responses indicated they would, um, which totaled about 118 kids. Now, we don't have space for 118 kids in an after-school program, probably. So we'll have to think about how we how we can manage that. Um, Bella's texting me, which tells me that I'm not going to send her. Oh, Christy is here. She just doesn't have a camera, so she's not popping up. Um, so I come to you today uh, with a proposal to add an after-school program to our service, our list of services for parks and recreation. Um, that program, in order for it to be, we have a good quality, really we need to have at least 12 kids in it. I don't think that that should be hard to do um, this time. Um, based on the numbers with 12 kids, we would um, project about $6,500 more expense than revenue if we charge $15 a day for the program. I received some um, question from a counselor about how do we come up with the $15 a day. We did an evaluation of what other recreation-based programs were charging. Um, they were anywhere from 70 to 90-ish. We decided that we really felt like we needed to be on the lower end of that scale. Um, the taxpayers, so the property owners and the renters through their monthly rent have already paid for the space um, at ASA Adams. So I don't think we need to, to have a huge, we're not having to pay um, an overhead for the space. Um, and I think um, we've been talking an awful lot about inclusion and social economic um, barriers to services. Um, I would prefer to be on the lower end of that charge at $15 a day. Um, yes, with only a, with a daily count of 12, we lose about $6,500. I, I find it hard to believe with the amount of um, response that will be at 12. Um, and then if we were at maximum capacity, which 
just thinking about the space without seeing it, we thought would be about 42, um, we would actually cover all of our expenses, both direct and indirect. So um, I, that's why I'm suggesting the $15 a day. Is that why you, is that? Well, let's know questions people have. Maybe there'll be some more information. Uh, council members, have any questions? I don't have any sure. questions. I was wondering, um, so during the school year, and of course the COVID has made everything, you know, top and turvy anyway. During the school year, typically the library will offer a camp for six weeks and they'll go read with dogs and things. Um, the stables will offer, you know, a camp. It will, and so, the program, uh, the program that I used to run took that into consideration and was flexible that way. Would that be something that we could also say to our parents is you, you know, you'll always have a space. So can the can the daily attendance change? Can the daily attendance change? So do you see what do you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like there's so, different things during school year. So we talk about um, five day a week slots we talk about three day a week um at the end of the day i'm not sure we really are final in our brain about how we are going to roll out the sign up uh, the goal that we have is to find a balance between flexibility and the ability to um effectively staff plan prepare for what's happening. Um, I, going from 40 kids to 10 kids would be really hard if you didn't know how many kids were going to show up each day. Um, you know, we talked about running it like a drop it and um, just decided that we would be spending an awful lot of money because we'd be staffing to the maximum. And um, so it really is about trying to find a balance and I think we're going to have to spend some more time with the university. I feel like we've already asked the university to give an awful lot of time on a we might do this. That's something that we would develop, but the goal would be we want to make sure we have enough people hired, trained and able to schedule them in a way that will keep employees that is going to require some planning. I would just add that part of part of this too is looking at it not just as a one year program is it's sustainability. Right. And I think one of the challenges that we had with a lot of our programs um, earlier on was we had a lot of in and out, which caused that program to not be as quality that we needed because people were always coming in and out and weren't counting on it to be there. So as we we figured that the nuts and bolts out to be able to say, okay, how do we smooth this out a little bit? One of those things was consistent, being consistent in how, how often people were there and what the numbers looked like yeah. so that we could plan and run a quality program. And I think that's that's a piece. Now, clearly we're gonna have to figure that out because there are these extra, is it going to change Star Wars Stables as a program that we run? Right. You know, obviously the, the library we is with the town and we work with them. So those are all things that we have control yeah. over how it goes out but i really think it's important to think about sustainability as we right. launch into this as well we had a i had a system where parents signed up a month in advance so they knew what day and if they didn't if their kids didn't like they knew when they were going to sign up and if their kids didn't show up they still had to pay because i had to staff yeah. uh, for you know 10 instead of five or whatever and 12 instead of you know, three for for us, so, the number of people showing up is two, just two factors for us. One is money, right? But the other is quality, right? So if I sign my kid up for five days because I'll just pay five days all the time, but she only goes two, yeah, then enough people do that, you're right back down to really low numbers, unless we're way up there. Now it's a juggling act. It's mm -hmm. a juggling act. So I am counting on my able staff. Megan will be um, overseeing this program for the town, and um, Dale Russell will be doing that for the university. So, to Cheryl Antonich's point, um, 
as someone who was the director of an after school program in the Bangor school system, um, what, what was very successful there in thinking about the sustainability of um, this kind of program and folding in some of the things that we already offer and that could already, that possibly are being offered by the school as well, um, is that, you know, at the beginning of each term, sending something that goes out to all the students, like a sign up sheet where people can sign up for choices, not guaranteeing what they would have, but choices that can then be, you know, compiled by the director of the person who's running the program and have it laid out, paid for, and scheduled a term at a time. Um, you know, it, it was a, <laughs> It was a lot of spreadsheets and paperwork and it was a couple of days of really, really intensive, terrible data entry. But like in the end, you have a great, you know, way to administer a program where you know what kids are supposed to be aware at all times. It gives the families the ability to prepare in advance. You can send a calendar home so folks know what, what's going on. Um, and I would like, like, I would see a program like this for this year as being an emergency stopgap measure. But I can see how this could be, you know, other things that we're already offering that are kind of satellite could all be folded in together in a way that might be um, successful, you know, for folks. Um, one of my questions was about, um, so in this kind of building off of uh, my work experience, is there going to be um, busing or anything like that? Or is this, this is definitely going to be, I would assume, parent pickup only? So this is parent pickup from okay. the, um, from ASA. from ASA. Uh, the one busing component that may or may not be added, we have only touched on it briefly with the university is campus recreation. So if they get swim lessons back there, or for the rock climbing and stuff like that, they have talked about potentially using a van to pick kids up and shuttle them where they need to go. Okay. But we are we have not finalized that. Um, I also would be, and I know this was in our background materials, but I would want us to um, consider, although we're not eligible for the federal subsidization of scholarships, that we would consider offering that for um, town folks in, in, the, in the interests of equity. Um, and I guess the, the only other thing I would say is like, in terms of the kind of language around the money piece, like, Maybe we could think of it as not losing money on anything, but spending money on, do you know what I'm saying? So, like, so because I can see why, I understand that there will be people, there will be taxpayers in this town of 10,000 people who will be irritated, even if it's just a one cent increase on the mill rate, but conceptually, philosophically will be irritated by the idea of like adding something, changing something, and it doesn't impact them. And I feel like how we language it could so help with that. In the background material, the point that I was trying to distill from a an hour and 45 minute conversation with Mitch is that I think in the past, town councils, in the absence of the comprehensive plan process, thought about this as all recreation programs needed to be self-sustaining not make money, but self-sustain. And when we got to a $50,000 a year after school program that was bringing in about $20,000 a year in revenue, it was definitely not self-sustaining. I, I guess I would challenge council to, if you wanna move forward with this, to not put staff in that position of sustainability but rather in a position of saying an after school recreation program is not about doing private sector work. It is about creating a vibrant parks and rec program for the community. And it lays in nicely with the um, priority to bring families with school age children to our community or to keep them way you look at it, right? Um, I don't ever want the town to be in a position to be foolish with its money, to waste money, to not pay attention to um, providing services in a, in a reasonably, um, you know, as good stewards of public dollars. But 
I guess the point I was trying to get to is I don't think we should be, you can if you want, you can raise the, the cost and we can make money. It's not really making it, but, and I would much rather see that registration fee lower. Um, and um, I would much rather see um, if it starts off slow and we only get 12 or 14 kids to understand that this is not a program that is necessarily going to come out in its final form. We're rolling this out very, very quickly and it might take some time to catch on. And I think for a lot of people, what we need to do is attract folks that maybe don't need childcare because it's such a great program. I mean, it's an enrichment program and, and it's it's a it's a community amenity as well. Yeah. But what did you, I know we talked, I just didn't have you a little while ago, but I was concerned about the kindergarten program that starts two weeks, has two weeks of half day. They won't be able to do it until they, they go full day. Yeah, so I have, I mean, we are, while there is space, that space is still space that is being used during the school right. day. So we're not anticipating any half day kindergarten um, programming. I'm not anticipating being able to use the facility for teacher and service days. I mean, I, um, and we are, we will need to talk with the university because the, it usually is if the university shuts down, all of the non-essential workers shut down, whether they're on or off campus. So I don't know that um, snow camp is going to be something that we can offer. When I think about where we are right now, being able to offer Monday through Friday when school is in session seems like a nice place to start. Right. Other questions? Uh, it, partially a question, uh, it, it also helped. Uh, when you were discussing with the university, talk about staff ratios, recommendations for school staff ratios, it's probably a tough for every time to go so, They're committed to that level of staffing. So our level of staffing is actually based on um, a minimum of three staff people that will get us to 18 kids, and then a ratio of um, six. So we add somebody uh, for the 19th kid, and once we got six more, when we get to the 25th kid, it would be another six. So it's um, one to six. And I, I like this idea. Um, as Rich explained, uh, the multi year program rather than just like an emergency stopgap. Because we heard from, from many people last winter and during the public health about how important the restoration of the people bus rep program was to them. And this seems while it may have a relatively small cost at first, it could also have a relatively larger revenue at some point. So, I, I will say uh, it's not all about me all the time, but for a few minutes this week it was. And the vision that I have for this is that it becomes the centerpiece of a really vibrant um, multifaceted program that we can run out of the school, capture kids and do all sorts of things that connect them in the community, learn new skills, meet people that they wouldn't normally see, all of that. Down the road, there are other community partners that might want to participate to offer a class for a term, or you know, there might even be faculty at the, the school system that would want to, you know, run a program after hours. Yep, it's a long time coming. It's a, it's a good idea. Well, I, I will tell you, it it works. I think you can see it working when we can be in ASA. Mm -hmm. um, when we couldn't be in ASA, it we couldn't make it work. I mean, when we were spending $500 a week for half time at the rec center, yeah. it, it created, it just didn't work. Councilor Mitchell, do you have any questions or comments? Um, no, I, I'm fully in support of this. I think it's a critical thing for our community and I, love it um and i i heard from like at least 20 parents just today about just how in support of this they are 
Um, so, and just kind of nightmare stories about how they've been juggling and need something. And so I think this is wonderful. Um, what are the hours? So at this point, we're talking about um, being ready to go a little bit before three, when the school day ends at three, and um, ending programming at five with an opportunity to pick up until 5.30. Uh, 5.30 is kind of a hard end for us because a lot of those same people are now going to transition into our youth sports programs, our staff and, and university staff, which usually start at 5.30. Okay, I do think that ending it at five, well, I mean, it depends, um, but the option to go to 5.30, I think is critical. Thank you. Any further comments? I just compliment our staff on seeing an opportunity and a need and working very quickly to put something that sounds very impressive together. We ready for a vote? Yes. On order 21 150. And I guess we're going to do a roll call vote because we have every more person. So, Nancy, please. Council Greener? In favor. Council Perry? In favor. Council Gardner? In favor. Council Robinson? In favor. Council Wingard? In favor. And Council Mitchell? Yes. And the vote is six in favor and there are none opposed. Great. Thank you. One more item. Order 21 151, order revising order 21 117 to extend the due date for the first payment of FY22 real estate and personal property taxes from September 23rd, 2021 to October 7th, 2021, with the date for second payment remaining the same, remaining due on February 10th, 2022. The rate of interest at 6% and for interest to begin accruing on said tax balances remaining as of October 8th, 2021 and February 11th, 2022. Can I have a motion to approve, please? Move approval. Second. A second, thank you. Sophie? So um, I held tax commitment as we were working through the REC um, issue. I wasn't sure what that number was going to be that was the potential variance because when you adopt a revenue budget that is less than an expense budget, you end up uh, with more money needing to be uh, raised from commitment. Um, so in doing that, when we started to look at when we would legitimately have um, the commitment done, which would be next Monday or Tuesday, based on this information, um, we, it, the bills still need to go to the printer. And so when we were looking at a two week turnaround for tax bills, that seemed really short to me. I am suggesting we add two weeks to give people, they should have about four weeks from the time it goes to the printer to the, to the time they do. Any questions? Ready for a vote? Nancy? Councilor Greenier? In favor. Councilor Perry? In favor. Councilor Gardner, in favor. Councilor Robertson, yes, in favor. Council Wingard, in favor. And Council Mitchell. Can't hear you. Right. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and the vote is six in favor, and there are none opposed. Okay. Is there any other business to be brought before us? The only business I have is on August 30th, next Monday, we have a uh, council committee meeting. There's a kind of a variety of items there. Um, we also have an executive session to talk about um, council manager um, performance um, relationship. And um, I anticipate that would take uh, between 45 minutes and an hour, which means that we have limited time for the rest of the agenda. I'm working at extensive background for you, hopefully concise, but good amount of background. And I would encourage you, you'll get that Friday afternoon or evening. I would encourage you to call me with any questions or if I need to submit 
more information ahead of time so that we're not bogged down in the meeting if that right. would work. Thank you for that. Um, so if we went then at, at some point in time, I, I think what a lot of us would like to see is where we ended up with total community value. So we're still finalizing that. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I, I was given a number that I felt was a little high. So I've asked them to go back and yep. double check. Um, so I don't want to tell you what no, it is. I, I don't want to hear it now. <laughs> but, but at some point, but when this. What you, what you will probably get um, if we commit on Monday is um, I would bring you the commitment sheet and we could right. quickly go through that so you would, would see. It is actually looking very good. Okay. Thank you. So if there's no other business, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We second it. I don't think we need a roll call vote on adjournment. So just wave, raise your hand. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for joining us, Laura. Bye. Well, thanks. You do this.